officiating uh, up north in York region. This is about my uh, tenth year. Um, so today we're going to be talking a little bit about our FIBA mechanics, especially in person. Um, just to show a hand, who's in their first year? Everybody. Oh, everybody. Minus, Minus one and two. Okay, cool. Um, so a lot of these things are just very, very basic things for you guys to work on. These are all just guidelines. When we get into a game, obviously, you got to get to where you got to get to to see a play, to make a decision, right? But for the most part, we try our best to stick to these guidelines, okay? Um, if you have any questions, just put your hand up. Like, it's very, very casual, okay? So, we're going to start right off from the beginning, okay? So, before every game that we have, um, maybe in your high school games and whatnot, we want to be on the court 15 minutes, or sorry, 15 to 20 minutes ahead of the game, right? By 15 minutes, we want to be on the court, ready, uh, ready to go, ready to watch the teams warm up, okay? So, you can see from that diagram over there, uh, in every game, you're going to have an R, which is your crew chief, and you're going to have a U, which is your umpire, okay? So, for the most part, that doesn't matter a whole lot. The minute the ball goes up, everything else is the same, okay? It doesn't matter if you're with a 30-year vet. It doesn't, it doesn't matter if you're first year, second year. Everything is the same, okay? Um, uh, as the crew chief, we want to make sure that uh, all the score sheets are ready, all the players, numbers, make sure that they have all their starters checked off. Um, make sure that score sheet is ready, make sure that our game operators, our shot clock operator, whatever we have to deal with from the table is all prepared. Okay, I don't, oh, last thing we want is we start a game and all of a sudden the girl doesn't know how to reset the shot clock or the guy doesn't know what he's supposed to mark off, how to put points up, okay? So we wanna make sure all of those things are ready, good to go, the table's good to go, okay? Um, usually, they say here at the two minute mark, we want to go introduce ourselves to the coaches. Generally, we do that a little bit earlier. I would say three minutes, three, three thirty, just because a lot of times that's when the teams stop their warm ups, they go into their coaches. So you don't want to have to bump shoulders with all the players who try to go introduce yourselves to the coaches, right? Um, at the beginning of the game and at halftime, when you have a minute thirty left on the clock, you're going to blow your whistle once, okay? And if there are still players shooting around, we're bringing them to the benches, okay? And in between periods, so in between the first and second, and in between the third and fourth, we're gonna blow the whistle at the third <coughs> second mark. All good so far? Yeah? So, now we get all the players to their benches, we're gonna start this game, okay? So, for the most part, whoever our R is, is gonna be the one tossing the ball. Now, for somebody like me, I, I'm, I'm small, I'm shorter guy, so my tosses aren't usually that good. So even if I'm the R, I could go over and be like, hey, you want to, can you toss it up for me today, right? Um, so whoever's going to toss it up, we're going to go across from the table. All right, we're going to be opposite from the table. And our U is going to be right behind, or right in front of the table, just like in that diagram over there, right? So, um... Once everything's ready, right, uh, my view checks with the scores table, hey, timer, whoever, are you guys all ready? Yes, you're ready. You turn around, you give the thumbs up to your partner, so now your partner's ready to throw the ball up, right? Before we start every game, we gotta blow the whistle, right? But one mistake that we always have is we blow the whistle and we keep the whistle in our mouth, okay? And then we go and toss the ball up. So you might think this is just a very, very minor thing, but the thing is, I've known so many officials that keep their whistle in their mouth, and the minute they toss that ball up, a bow goes up, or somebody's hand gets caught in the lanyard, and you pull a teeth out, you get knocked in the chin, all sorts of stuff, right? Mm -hmm. So anytime possible, just <clears throat> blow the whistle, let it drop, right? You got your lanyard on, just let it drop, and then you're gonna go and toss the ball. Yeah. Oh, don't worry about it. This is two men. I'm gonna ask the last question. Okay. Um, and then for our U, the minute our, our official is ready to toss the ball, we're going to stand in front of the scorer's table with our hands up, right? The minute that ball gets tossed and tipped, we're chopping it in. 
right? Same thing as we do if we're establishing, or sorry, administering a throw in, we pass the ball and then we chop it in, right? So anytime, once that ball gets tapped, we're gonna chop that time in, okay? Um, whichever way the ball goes, whoever is our U in this case is gonna go to the end line and they're gonna become our new lead, right? And then our other official, who, our tossing official is now gonna become our new trip. Okay, it doesn't matter which way they go. Cool. So, just gonna talk about positioning a little bit. Um, so lead and trail are always going to be asked to box all the players in, okay? So whenever we have players that, we wanna keep all 10 players within that frame, okay? So if you look at that top diagram right there, we have, our, we have our trail on the table side uh, sideline, and then our lead is opposite on the end line. Okay? Um, if you take a look at that second diagram, um, our lead is all the blue lines. So let's say, let's say we're talking about this diagram right here. We're going that way to start, right? So now our trail is over here, and our lead is over here. So our lead, our lines of responsibility for our lead is this whole end line and the sideline, whichever the lead is on. Okay, so similarly for the trail, we're taking care of this sideline and we're taking care of the half court, the division line. Okay, now if we move these guys over and now this is our trail and this is our lead, same thing, lead is taking care of this end line and they're corresponding to the sideline and then same thing for the trail. Trail is going to take that sideline and So we now we're gonna move on to areas of responsibility once we get into our positions, okay? So we always break the court down into, well, I, I break it down into three quadrants. So just think of one and six is the same, two and five is one, and three and four is the other, okay? So as our trail, we're responsible for everything in this diagram, in one, two, three, and six, right? Anything in four, when it's on ball, this leads primary coverage, right? Now, five's the tricky one. Five is a little bit of a dual area, right? You could have drives that originate from that first quadrant going into five, right? <coughs> or we could have some, somebody driving from three into five, which might be a lead, uh, which would be a lead coverage, okay? Um, can you still, I wanna ask this, yeah. but you can still call it. Let's say you park in five minutes there. Yeah, you can still call it. As, as, as a secondary? For sure. Um, I mean, we, I, I could go on forever about it, but I mean, like, if I have a play that my partner misses and it's off, like, my grandma in the fucking 30th row knows that's a foul, I'm coming in and I'm, I'm following it. Okay? Um, for the most part, at this point, we want to make sure that we, we are putting trust in our partners, right? There might be something that, to me, so let's say I'm in trail over here, and there's a, there's a baseline drive from four going to the basket. And from my angle, it looks like a foul. But the thing is, lead sees something, because that's lead's primary area, right? Lead sees the start, develop, and finish of the play, and, they, and then they go on to make a decision, and the decision was to have a no call. I'm not saying like if the decision is right, wrong, and different, right? But at this stage in our careers, we need to put trust in our partner. Okay, so if I'm in trail and my lead misses a call, I'm gonna give him the benefit of the doubt that he saw the start, develop, finish, and his decision was to make that was to not make a call. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, so this is the same diagram, just on the flip side. So trail now, <coughs> which which four quadrants is the trail responsible for? <laughs> One, two, three, four, and lead is responsible for six. Six, six. and five is a shared okay. okay. um, So, for those of you like we've all gone through, we've all gone through our training programs. We've always been told that, hey, we want to be active and uh, active as an official, both in lead and in trail, right? So, let's start off by talking about trail. 
So if we go back to we go back to this diagram, you know how I said we're gonna split the court into three sections? So we have forget four, five, six, we're just gonna go one, two, and three. Okay. So based on these quadrants, we never want to be a full quadrant away from the bottom. Okay? So let's say uh, first diagram, top left, right? Ball is on trail side. So trail right there is in a good position because it's right there. I can see that play. I'm officiating the space between it, right? We're in good position. The minute that trail, the minute that trail, or sorry, the minute this off ball matchup starts moving over, I want to start adjusting this trail because I can't just stay there. If I stay there, all of a sudden I'm going to have bodies in front of me. I can't see that off ball matchup anymore, right? Yes, no? Yes, yes, okay. Um, where is it? Okay, so yeah, so this would be an example now. If the ball started over here and now they start dribbling over, I, ha I in trail, I have to work the arcs. That's what they call it, right? So we want to move along this arc to get the best look at that play. We want to be able to put ourselves in a position to see the space between the offensive player and the defensive player. Because if you think about it, if there's any fouls, uh, violations and whatnot, where is it going to happen? It's going to happen in that space between the offensive player and the defender, right? So that's why we want to keep that open space. So similarly, if the ball goes all the way over to the weak side now, what do we do in trail? We started over here, right? So if the ball goes all the way over to that weak side, we're going to move all the way over near the middle. Okay? So we can continue to have that open angle. Okay? Questions about trail? Yeah. This is a question I noticed just from the weekend here. So yep. bottom right uh, diagram. Yep. So you end up in a little bit of a funny position as the trail because, like you said, you want to box in all the players, right? Yes. But now in this particular diagram, all the players on the left, mm -hmm. okay? They're in a little bit of a gray zone, right? Because right. the lead is going to watch this play, is what I find, is they're kind of in this intermediate area here. They're going to move into that quadrant in, in where the lead is, and then the trail has to what? Back up as quickly as he can so that he can see all the players on his left in the corner. Is that the goal? So How do you that's, actually, that's actually a really good question. So when we, talk, when we go back to our training, they always want us to see the front of the rim, right? So when we're in trail over here, they want us to be at a 45 degree angle, right? So similarly, now, if we're talking positioning only, <laughs> once we move into that middle area, I'm no longer just gonna be at a 45, right? I don't wanna close my vision off to see just this, right? So I might wanna position myself a little bit more parallel to the end line. Just so now, I, I'm still watching this, but from <coughs> we all have peripheral vision, right? From my peripheral, I can still see what's going on, okay? Chances are, nothing's gonna happen here. Yeah. Right, the ball's over here, what are these guys gonna do? Unless you have like a matchup, like these two guys are gonna fight. Right, right. but other than that. <coughs> that's, that's where a ton of the screening action would be going on. Yeah, Sorry? A, ton, a ton of the screening action would be going on on that weak side. On this weak side? Yeah. Yeah, you're right. So, Pardon. as much as we wanna have a peripheral, that's not all we're counting on, right? What is our lead supposed to be responsible for here? Right? If our lead's gonna go all the way out here, his vision is coming through here, okay? So Lee's got a great look. If we have to extend all the way over, we gotta extend all the way over. So that is why our lead, or in any position, we should never be ball watching if the ball's not in my primary coverage area, right? Because if Lee starts watching this, and I only can see this peripherally, and now, knock on wood, somebody starts fighting over here, I got two officials looking at the ball, and I got a scrap in the corner, and nobody's covering. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yep. Uh, just to kind of go back to what you were saying. Um, so if the ball goes down into the lead squadron, is trail then going kind of back towards where they started? Or so you're you know? saying the ball's here, and then if they dribble over there. Yeah. Right. So no, our trail, you're asking if he backs up. Like a little bit, or is that right? Most likely, we're going to stay in this position. Just stay there? Right. Because if we stay in this position and we're still and we're still angling ourselves so we're looking down this way for a throw, right? that gives us the best look off ball on any cutting action, screening action like you were talking about. Yeah. Because now, if the ball goes into that corner and I skip out, what happens now if this ball gets passed back out here? Now I gotta go back to the middle. 
couldn't solve the economy of motion. Uh, and so we'll take five steps there, take five steps, uh, steps back out just to go back. Yeah. Just great things. Perfect. Yeah, no, that's a great question. Are we all good? Good. Yeah. Okay. So next I'm gonna talk uh, about our lead positioning. So when yeah. Sorry. So it was interesting that you called that out because the other day working the art, I was told that if you are at the top of the T, the ball's in the corner, and that you don't want all eyes on the ball because they don't take two graphs to look at the same direction. Yeah. So so I don't know. Um, so I don't, I don't really understand. So pretty much, you're saying that we need to have our peripheral and be able to see the side. But I was told, like working the heart, is being able to see the other side of the court because you don't want all the ball. Like they're not getting two wraps to look at the same like. Exactly. So that's what I'm saying. If, our, if we're working the arc to come out here, if my trail's watching out here, my lead should not be watching the ball. Correct? My lead should be looking the other way. Off ball, rebounding action, screening action, cutting. Right? So does, does that kind of answer your yeah, question? Yeah. If my trail's going to pay attention that way, my lead's going to pay attention. So, yeah. So we're not always covering the same. Right. Because if we both cover that, nobody's watching the other eight guys. Something's going to go wrong, right? So in the bottom right corner, as, as lead, uh, say the ball is swung along the baseline uh, for an inbounds play or whatever the case, can the lead pull off of the line to get a bigger uh, or like wider range or a wider look of the play? So like the lead is there, and then they actually back up into the wall. Like say there's a wall, a wall just behind where the lead is to get a wider range or like a wider look of the play. Because maybe on that inbounds pass, what's happening is the lead is like directly on ball coverage, but then the ball is swung across. And then they need to be able to see the whole wide range of the play. Okay, so you're saying on bottom right. my, my lead is here, yeah, and then so as this ball is getting swung? Yeah, the ball gets like swung around. along the baseline uh, in the bottom right play. Mm -hmm. And then it gets swung along the baseline, the lead pulls back so off here. of yeah, <laughs> And then uh, along the baseline on like an inbounds pass. And then the lead will actually like pull off of the uh, the end line to be able to get a wider range. A pass goes along the base along the end line. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then like the lead would pull in and then off the ball as well to get a wide range of blocks in the player. So like A B C, right? So yeah. So this is our A position. <laughs> yeah. This is our And then B, but then like they're in B and then would we be able to step back off of the end line to be able to get a wider range of play? If the gym allows it. Uh, I don't, the gym think, has enough space, so I I don't think we need to pull <laughs> any further back from this. Uh, just because if generally <coughs> in our positions, if so let's say this is my end line, the furthest I'm gonna go is probably where the three point sorry, where the three point line is, maybe another half a step back. Um, from there you should be able to see that sideline or the is the least coverage. Right? I should be able to see everything along this end line going down to the other side. Right? So, we don't think we need to feel any further back. Cool. All good? Trail? Okay. Lead is essentially the same thing. Like I said, we want to cover all the players. But So, let's say in this situation, we have our lead in what? In our, which position is this? B. In our B position. Then. Right? So, what is our coverage area for lead right now? What are we supposed to be looking at in lead? Sorry? Six and five. Six and five, right? So this would be our four or six, and this is our five. So we're looking at anything off ball, right? Any cutting action, screening action, if a shot gets put up, rebounding action, right? And similarly to how we described it over here, this corner, again, Chances are not a whole lot is going on over there, right? But the thing is, peripherally, we still want to have some type of an opinion if something is to happen back there, right? So in our lead position here, we probably don't want to be at a 45. We probably want to be a little bit more parallel, just so I can 
I can still see the key, but peripherally I can still see that point. Right? Now, as this ball gets moved, as this ball gets moved over, once it passes that lane line, my lead wants to, I'm gonna start being parallel with the ball. Right? I'm gonna be moving with the ball wherever that ball goes to because I want to square in all the players, right? Does that make sense? Okay. No questions for me? Um, okay, so here are our just main duties as a trail official. So anytime we have a two-point shot, two-point <coughs> shot, um, our trail official is going to mark, so one, two, three, and our corner area, okay? So two-point shot comes up, put a hand up to signal the attempt and then the make. Um, we want to be sure of any shots that are close to being at the box, if it gets released in time or not, right? Um, Goaltending goal and interference, so a lot of times our lead is not, uh, what's the word? The lead is not responsible for looking up at the net, right? If a layup goes up, did it go off the glass before it gets blocked, or when the ball on its way down it gets blocked, okay? Trail's got the best look on that, right? Trail yeah. sees the big picture from the outside, they're not looking away from the net, so we, the trail has the best opinion. Uh, rebounding situations, there's going to be a whole lot of clutching and grabbing in the key that only Lee's going to be able to pick up. So when we talk about rebounding situations here, for the most part we're talking about guards crashing the glass, um, maybe the big fellas who like to bump guys under the net, right? Those are all things that our Lee probably can't pick up from the end line. So that's where our guards come in. Oh, sorry, that's where our trail comes in. Uh, low post area. For the most part, it's just on that strong side. So in here, where that dark brown circle is, that post area, because that's our primary coverage area. Traveling violations, 24 seconds. Um, and then we talked about these. Look in the arc, box in the players. Um, one thing that I catch a lot, and I did this for years before I got reamed out for it. Anytime we have a drive to the basket, or anytime we have a shot go up, our tendency in trail is shoot. This is probably if it goes in, I gotta get back the other way. If it misses, chances are we have a defensive rebound. I gotta go the other way, right? But that's the wrong way to think about it because we need to be in there to help with rebounding coverage. So anytime a shot goes up, anytime a drive goes to the basket, what do we want to do? We want to take a step down, right? And whether or not that puts us into a better position, I don't care. It just means that I know that you guys are not thinking about going back the other way, right? So if you take that step down and you put that into your habit, <coughs> you start getting out of the habit of thinking, I gotta get back. Because, like, I'm just looking around the room, you guys are more than athletic enough to get back, even if they beat you, like, they might beat you by a step or two, but you can be right back, right? So make sure, make sure, make sure, anytime we have a shot, drive to the basket, we step down, okay? Um, okay, same thing now for the lead, okay? Anytime we have any post, post plays uh, in that lighter gray area on the right, that's all our lead coverage. Uh, play under the basket, so anything in that quadrant five, anything uh, like a rebound putback, those we want to have an opinion on. Uh, fouls away from trail, anything that the trail can't see, drives to the basket. And then same thing with the principles here. We want to be moving all the time in lead to get the best look that we can, right? To put ourselves in the best position, box players in, yada, yada, yada. All right. <coughs> throw ins. Um, you guys have any questions about throw ins? Because I feel like this is a really stupid shot topic to talk about. You guys have anything you're not sure about with throw ins? Uh, very quickly, yeah. yeah. So I was reminded uh, a couple games ago that the only time the ball in whistle throwing is if it's on their own basket or to start a quarter, the, to start the quarter at the ha at the half line. Okay. That was only two situations. Okay, so uh, so let's say high school games where we got eight eight minute quarters, right? At the beginning of every quarter, I'm blowing my whistle before I administer the throw. Okay, that's number one. Number two, the other one is when we have a front court end line throw. 
So right here, ball stays in the front court, headline thrower. Anytime I put the ball in, I'm blowing my whistle first. So think of it as the end line being a very vulnerable spot because it's just a pass and a layup, right? So we want to blow our whistle so that I'm letting all 10 players and my partner know, hey, we're coming in. Right? Other spots, like if we have a sideline or a backcourt throw in, maybe not as vulnerable, so we don't have a whistle before we put the ball in. At least that's how I think about it. So um, those are the only two times. Uh, we after a timeout? Not after a timeout. Not? Only at the beginning of the quarters. Yeah. When you're up, then when well, you're on the back court, there's two the spots in the end of the front court and the beginning of the end, that where the front court or the beginning of the end of that of the front court. When you're the administering yeah. official, mm -hmm. so you're the administering mm -hmm. official mm -hmm. in the front court, particularly when they're in a spot where they can score pretty quickly, <laughs> whether it's sideline or line, what are you watching? As the administering. Okay, so. When we put that ball in, so let's say I'm, let's say I'm over here, I'm in lead, right? So I put the ball in, I, I start my count, I got my hand up to signal my clock. It's the, it's essentially the same thing as where our primary coverage area is during live play. So my main focus is the paint and probably the first passer, because I mean, the, apart from the long kickout passes to the, to the trails primary coverage area. If I'm the lead, these two quadrants are my main quadrants where they're probably going to get the ball. So that's still what I'm responsible for, right? My trail is over here. He or she is still responsible for everything else. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. I just, I find myself sometimes struggling with watching the action off the ball mm -hmm. that I know is in my quadrant. Mm -hmm. and you're setting whatever you want to call it some sort of illegal screen. But you also gotta watch the line and that person and that defender. Right. So well, so, so when I put the ball in, so let's let's say he's my player. Come up here for a second. He's my player, this is my end line. So but I got my hand up, I put the ball in and I'm taking two or three steps back. I don't want I don't want to be right here. Because if I'm right here I can't see what he's doing. I can't see where his feet are right now, right? But if I take a step that's why we want to bounce everything now, right? I want to be able to take two, three steps out, bounce, and now I can see where his feet are, right? And right now I, I can see what Adam's doing over there in the back corner. So I have my peripheral. I'm still boxing all the players in, so I still have a good view of everything that's going on, right? So, I mean, that, I think that's a, that's a really good point, right? Anytime we have throw-ins, we want to have distance between ourselves and the person that's throwing that ball. Just so we have a wider view we can see from our peripherals. Because if I'm here, Number one, if he's if he's inbounding the ball over here and I'm standing right beside him, I don't I can't see what's going on over here. I'm way too close to him. He's probably uncomfortable, right? So I want to be able to take those two or three steps back, and now I can see a whole lot more, right? Yeah. You prefer to hand it to him and then back up, or or bounce back? We are now. This just changed this year. We are bouncing everything. So in the back court, sideline, sideline, front uh, front court, end line, we're bouncing everything. So we're not handing off. Oh, you know that what you like to score. Why? Uh, one of them was the one I just talked about. Okay. <clears throat> I just want to have these three steps. Um, uh, I think for the most part, that's the main one. I mean, like, I can hand off and take two or three steps. But then the ball already went. But you're from the in, very, from the moment you touch it, you already do. Right, in those, in that second, second and a half, bang, something happens over here, I can see. Right? If they fumble it, I take the ball back, I say, sorry guys, ball's wet, wipe it on my hands, I come back. Yeah. Right, use your judgment, like, if he thinks too bad, dribbles it on the court, that's a different story. Right? Exactly. But, um, oh, uh, sorry. So, I was just explain to me that when someone's inbounding, they are allowed to step on the line, it's just they can't step on the court when they're inbounding. Yeah. Okay, I was, I was. Yeah, so, this, if this, this is my, out of bounds. If this is my end line. Yeah, that's, that's what he explained to me. He's, and if this is out of bounds, this is inbounds, I can step on the line as long as no part of my feet steps inbounds. Right? 
right? So as long as I'm on the line or behind, I'm all good. Okay. Um, okay, so yeah, that was, those are my points. Make sure we're bouncing the ball, okay? Uh, whistle at the beginning of the quarters, not timeouts. I don't know why, don't ask me that. Um, and what's my third one? Oh, and then we're blowing the whistle uh, also when we're in the front court and line. Okay, not the sidelines, not the back court, front court and line. Okay? Uh, one thing I always forget is like, when they can run the end line. So after a main basket, main basket? Yep, okay. after a main basket, after a main free throw, yeah. they can run that in. Okay, okay, okay. okay. Otherwise, they got to stay put. They're allowed one, one, step. one step. Yeah, right, yeah one, one step, step left. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. okay. The key thing to remember is if there's a score, there's a timeout when they come back. They can still run yeah. in. Yeah. That's right. Oh, okay. always. That is good. Great point. Quick, this is a good question. So after that step, step, if they take more than step, you call them violation, right? You blow your whistle, hands out violation. What, what do you call it? Just say. It's a throwing throw violation. Throwing oh, violation, yeah. yeah. There's, I don't, there's no signal, no nothing. I know, there's no traveling. Just tweet, right. throwing yeah. violation, black, <coughs> red ball. Uh, How many games have you all done? Have you guys done more than a dozen so far? Yeah. 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 And your comfort level right now? You okay with it? Yeah. Well, they're not giving us any time. Some of you will be put into situations where there are volatile you know, um, teams and so on. That's just something that you get accustomed to. Right? Your own level of confidence and certainty will increase as you get into the hit on the floor more and more and more and more. I have too much beats. Too much job. Hard to do. I believe it. But I do. <laughs> and again, it's just the more and more time you get, the better. And then when you're working with individuals as well, you're going to have individuals that you know, Tommy had, I'm sure when you first started, I had, that choose not to do the right things. End line stuff. They're like, oh, what a kid. Just go down and say, Try to impress upon them that you're in, in your years that you want to learn the proper mechanics and so on. Because it really will help you. And I will tell you that we are critiqued and we are judged by spectators and coaches and evaluators that happen upon the scene and it's upon us if we're doing lazy mechanics it's going to show in our game right we're all here to have a certain level of standards i say of excellence we should all strive to be somewhat excellent in everything that we do whether it's basketball or any part of life so you strive to do that right and you get better because we're more actively engaged in what it is that we're doing and how we do it regardless of what our you have to force a switch, but they don't want us to switch. So, so <coughs> how would you suggest that we do that? Because I would like to throw this in over there. That, that's happening a lot with some of the senior officials. Where it's showing and telling the game is being filmed. Yeah, and <laughs> so we do the camera. Game I'm game. getting videos of us. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, so that's a great question. Yeah. Before the game, please. They'll help you along the way. Uh, and I mean this because the majority of individuals that we have will help young officials strive to get better. And that's a great point. Is like whenever I'm working with a younger official, less you know, less experience, you know, I always tell them before the game, I mean, when I work with Tommy when he started, we're doing things by the book. Because you're not gonna get better. Right? Um, actually the older officials aren't either, but maybe some of them maybe they're just getting a little lazy, but you need to remind them like uh, Tommy said. You need to remind them that, hey, you're there to get better. And you appreciate it. And you do it in such a way as not, you know, you say it in a nice way and say, please, can we do this? 
But I, I agree, that's, yeah. And you will have officials that will say, because you are very young, don't worry about it, kid, I'll look after this game. Okay? That's all fine and dandy. But again, you need to in front of the <coughs> Find that you have someone that is opposed to that. Do not get into any kind of confrontation with them. Finish up the game. Make a mental notation of the things that you have to do right in that particular game, so that you're not left at a disadvantage. Because again, what do we control? Our mechanics, our hustle, our tone, conversations, whatever comes out of our mouth. That's in my control. That has nothing to do with my partner. So if we can control those four or five things then at least we know we've done what we can in our game to make the game the best possible scenario for us, regardless of what my partner does. Fair? Mm -hmm. And just to piggyback on that, um, even when you get into, say, fourth, fifth, sixth year, you're going to have games where it might be U10, not very competitive. Those are opportunities for you to work on things like that, all right? To work on Okay, where do I gotta go? What are my, my mechanics look like, right? So, <coughs> try to build good habits, never get into the bad habits of, oh, I'm not gonna go over there, I can just put it here, it's the same thing, right? Because, like, till this day, if you work with Bobby, Peter, and myself, I don't really care who I work with, but we're gonna do things properly, right? And it, it goes to show, because coaches might not say it, players might not say it, parents might not say it, but at the end of the day, some of them do see it, right? And it builds credibility for yourself if I'm getting into the right spot. That's a standard. There's this mentality, I think I know whether it's across Ontario or all of Canada, but I'm going to use Ontario because that's what I'm familiar with. When I hear other coaches and teams coming to the, uh, to the Toronto, I talk about some of the officiating by comparison to my colleagues outside of the GTA area, that we are superstars. And I don't say that because I think I'm arrogant or any of the officials on the Toronto board, you know, are all that. I say that because when those teams come in and they see the level and the standard that's been set by the Toronto officials, it is so apparent when they go outside of the GTA area and they get into, uh, or they see officials that are not as uh, engaged or they don't hustle. Uh, I'm telling you, Tommy just said that I don't care if it's a U10 game and it's not a competitive game. That is the best time to practice your mechanics, to practice your abilities on the floor. Because I'll tell you, when you get to the high school level game, when you get higher and competitive, you're going to be a fish out of water if you don't play. Those are the best time. I don't care what level the piece it is. Those uh, equal play games, the uh, novice time, mm -hmm. it's you can. Mm -hmm. Trust me when I tell you that. Some of the hardest basketball to officiate, but a great opportunity for us to learn what we can Uniform. All those things come into play. When I walk into a gym like Peter and Tommy, and coaches who are sometimes very volatile, and they watch them walk into the gym, they're like, okay, there's a level, there's a predictability of how that game is going to be officiated. Why? Because we spent so much time learning just the basic mechanics of it. And if you look great, and your mechanics are crisp, and you are engaged, trust me, it goes a long way. A long, long way. Same with Dr. Your Time. Tommy, so. One last, I just going to add a note to it. Like, like Bobby's not blowing smoke about going across the province and seeing the refs and call it. I'll ask Richard. Richard's went <coughs> everywhere. He's on the offset with his team. Got all sorts of teams in, some other trees and went being everywhere. Honestly, your opinion as far as what you see from Toronto compared to when you go you don't have to say the cities, but elsewhere. It's better. Much yeah. better. And what do you notice is the biggest difference? I think there's a, a much bigger pool of uh -huh. good officials. But what makes them good that you say, hey, you know? I think some of those same things. Yeah. I think a big part is what we were discussing earlier with personality. Yeah. You know, introducing themselves, saying hello, developing a rapport. Mm -hmm. You know, some games you go to, you just start the game, you don't even acknowledge your presence. And, and really, when it comes down to it, coaches <coughs> and coaching are paying your fee. Yeah. Like, well, you're the only two guys or girls in the gym being paid right now, and you're big time us. Right? So, you know, so, you know, nobody in Toronto really does that. Anymore. Coaches. I think that's a big one too. Communication with coaches is pretty good in Toronto. 
it's not so good in most other places. It's okay, I didn't want to be on the spot, but I just yeah, that, maybe communication yeah. Yeah, so just to piggyback on that as well, when we talk about communication, it's not just how I speak to you or how we're communicating, it's also how I present myself, right? I like Bobby and Peter can attest to this. I don't know how many hours I've been and it sounds stupid, because I also thought it was stupid in my first two or three years. The amount of hours I've spent standing in front of the mirror just to work on my hit signal, my shooting point signal, my push, it's ridiculous. Like, I think about it now, and I was like, that's actually a lot of time, and it's actually helped me a lot more, because now when I make my calls, at least I think I look very, very confident, right? Uh, I'm, like, if I come up to the table, I go, okay, two pushes, two push and I just walk away, that's, that's different, right, from a confident official. Right? So in terms of how I communicate that with my scores table, coaches see it, players see it, fans see it, you want to exert that confidence. Right? So just to piggyback on that communication piece. Uh, so we've got some five afters on set. Okay, perfect. We're almost there. Um, okay, we're going to talk about calling fouls for a sec. Okay? So when we call a foul, in my first year, the hardest thing to do was to get my hand up, right? I blow the whistle, I know that's a foul, I know he hit her, uh, I know she hit her on the arm, but I always forget to put my hand up, right? Anytime we have a whistle, there are three things we gotta do. We either go up for out of bounds, violations, whatnot, we either go uh, fist for a foul, or we gotta jump ball, right? Nothing else, right? So, when we're calling a foul, first thing I gotta do, I go tweet, I'm popping my, I'm popping my fist up. Okay, so that's our first part. Right away, we want to let our partners know what happened and where the ball is going. Okay, so I go tweet, 11 hits, two shots. And I go to the table, I go red 11 <coughs> hits, two shots, right? Um, if, it's, if it's on the end line, I go tweet, red ball, end line. And I go to the table, um, 15 blocks, end line. Okay, so when I'm doing, so what are the things I'm doing, right? I First, I call out the team, so white, black, red, blue. I'm calling out the number, 11, okay? And then I have the nature of the foul. Do we have a hit? Do we have a shooting foul? Do we have a block, push? Uh, what else is there? Hand check. Looks hand check? No, just don't do nope. a hand check. It's either a push, a block, because what, what what does hand check say? This this is a hand check. No, like a like an actual hand check, like a guy. Call a hit. Yeah, yeah. you call hold. Call, call a hit. Call a hold. Call call hold. hold. Mm -hmm. okay. that, that's just my two cents. If you guys don't have to agree with it, you guys can call a hand check if you want. I've never called a hand check, right? Because a hand check is essentially a push. A hand check is essentially a hold, right? Do you call a hit to the hand? Sorry. Yes. That's part of it. Yeah, for sure. Like if a girl goes to the basket, we had that the other day, a girl goes to the basket, a uh, big girl tries to swipe and catches her in the head, I'm calling hit to the head. Cause it seems like whenever you say hit to the head, the coaches don't say shit. Exactly. They that. don't yeah, say yeah, yeah. nothing. You can <laughs> blow a call and go over there. Get to the head closer. Because I call it just like hit. I call it just like hit. I forgot that call. Yeah. And I use it next time. Like you said, hit to the head. It's probably one of the best ones to call if it act like it happens, not, yeah. it's not going to be a blocking foul and I go, hey, hit to the head just to get the coach off my back because then now I lose credibility, right? <laughs> but if it happens, and like, because sometimes hit to the head, even if it's a slight hit, for me, I'm calling because I don't, like, I can't tell how severe that hit is, right? <coughs> People's tolerance to hits to the, hits to the heads are different, right? So the minute I call hit to the head, like, coaches aren't going to argue. You're not gonna argue, right? Um, so yeah, so so boom, uh, red eleven hits, blue ball end line. So I know it says here. What have you guys been told? To run? No. To the reporting area? No. Yeah. No. Just no. through area. Yeah, they want you to run. Walk with purpose. Walk with purpose. Okay. So I think this, I think this is a little bit old. That's one. Um, in the last seven or eight years, they want us running over to the reporting area. I think it looks silly. If, I, if I'm in lead, 
I, uh, I call the foul, and the red 11 hits, blue ball. And then I got a red, 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 stop. And then I do all my mechanics. I think that was silly, right? We go back to how we communicate with our body language. How does that look compared to if I go tweet and I just walk with a purpose, go to my reporting area, 50 hits, two shots. That looks a lot better to me just because I'm not in a rush. I might not be in a rush, but I look like I'm in a rush, right? So if I have a brisk walk, walk confidently, walk with a purpose, Ash, get to the spot. Timber rain will show you a good walk. Okay. Um, we want to make sure. Sorry, a quick question. I've seen guys just yell from the headline. Oh. <laughs> Yeah, blue, two, block. Yeah, and then he'll tell you, yeah, yeah, don't worry, stay over there. I'm just going to bounce it over here. Right? It's the same thing. Don't be lazy. Right? And again, you're going to get guys like that. Put it in the back of your mind that, hey, I'm not going to say nothing, but I know that's wrong. I'm going to do that. So technically speaking, if uh, I'm trailed in a full court press, talk to Tim about and there's a the reason like, <laughs> as far as possible you can leave the score table. I gotta go as, well what I'm trying to explain to me is that as I'll long show, as I come and they can hear me, I don't really have to go across the courts and yeah. yeah. So the old The old question. way that they wanted you to do is always so let's say we're going that way and we got a foul down here that the lead calls. Right? The old way they wanted us to do they want lead to come up here to this reporting area. They want us to get there. They want us to run there, get to the reporting area, stop, do whatever we got to do, and then come all the way back. But now we're okay as long as we clear because the players are all here, right? As long as we clear this pack, we come out here, yeah. and I can see the scorer's table. There's nothing obstructing me and the scorer. I can just go, hey, red 11, hit two shots, and I'm already there. I don't even got to move. I coach the game at Ruto and I seen the same scenario and the trail kept reporting it to the table. <laughs> he, called, he told his guy he kept throwing him at the table. I don't so so he flows and goes, Marvin, blue 11. Yeah, Marvin goes, blue 11. Yeah. Okay. So, so that doesn't make sense because now if I go over to Marvin and I go, what happened? I don't know. Tommy told me. <laughs> It was a senior Like I said, there are going to be, and take it with a grain of salt, but there are going to be guys that are going to be a little bit lazier, right? And that's just something that you got to worry about. So yeah, anytime, whoever calls the foul, we're going to trail. doesn't matter which side, you call the foul, you're the new trail. Offensive foul, you're the new trail. Rebounding foul, you're the new trail. You know what I have a problem with is um, it's still like a rebound, yeah. push, going the other way. So I say foul, and then I'll be like, uh, I don't even know how to fucking explain. You don't ask me for it. <laughs> foul, possession, well, and then, and then I will report it. And then my guy doesn't really know what I'm saying until I say, yeah, foul's on this guy. Okay, we're going the other way. Okay, so, so I find that kind of hard. Can you explain that? Like, give me that. Like, so you're saying your partner doesn't know what's going on? Like I said, I call it because those are the ones I don't get a lot. I get the defensive push. Okay, so what? So it's a rebound. Let's say it's a rebound. Offense. Okay. Wobbles up. We call it the foul of the offensive rebound. Thank you very much. So back to what we were talking about before. If I blow my whistle, what am I doing? You you're you're stop the clock. You right. I stop the clock. I go red eleven pushes blue ball end line. Yeah. Yeah, used to it. I don't say the red ball. Yeah. I just go boom, blue ball, and line. Yeah. Okay, so you can say yeah. And if your partner's not the same, that's on it. All right, all right, right. Yeah, but sometimes I'll even hold my partner because I know I'm coming back here and he's staying here without switching, right? Just just that. Uh, come back. I don't do it. I know the NBA does it. The NBA goes loose ball, red, or loose ball, stay here. Um, uh, but for us, we don't have a loose ball signal, and we don't have the signal, right? So it's just boom, and then, like, I just, I just got to be loud, because that's one of the first things we talk about. We want you guys to use your voice, right? It's, uh, like, I'm still working on it, and I'm 10 years in. 
right? But if I go tweet, uh, if I'm calling for Rich, I go tweet, blue ball. And if he if he doesn't know, he's going, what do you got? I, go, I got blue ball coming in that my partner should know, right? So that's about that communication piece. Well, what if he thinks you said blue foul? You shouldn't be saying blue why would I? Why would I need to tell you? That? I just need to tell you. Some people do say blue file. Okay, so for everybody in this room, don't do that. Just go blue ball coming in. Spread the word, right? End line, right? Um, I thought they were sorry. I thought they were getting rid of that word. You have to say like end line. Just like, just from what I heard, like they're gonna get rid of that. Like, they are, and I think once we get more comfortable with our rule sets and with our mechanics. That can be taken out, just because if I if I see Adam call a foul over there, I know where the ball's going, right? If the ball went through the basket, I'm going to the sideline. If the ball stays within the key, I'm going to the end line, right? So I could just go boom, blue ball, right? But for the time being, um, if you're working, uh, like if, if I was working with you, I'd be like, boom, blue ball coming in on the end line. How's that going over, right? Just to clear things up, right? Um, you guys, we, I, I know we gotta wrap up. Do you guys have any other questions? Because I, I'm just gonna stop. Yes, you. yes. Yeah. So, I find a referee, referees call the bumps when you're playing defense, so I'm a bump here. But a lot of guys are riding the guys like this and they're not calling it. So there's, there's a difference. RSPQ. Right, so we have our RSPQ group that's the offensive players RSPQ get. So it's good to get balance quickly. Reverse. Um, if I'm playing defense, if I'm playing defense and I have my hand here, I'm okay because I have an extended outside of my. So what time? We got it. Reverse. Forget the R. What's R again? Rhythm. 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 So if I'm playing Thank defense, you. the guy goes right. If I'm like this and I'm that front, I'm okay. Right. Where we do have an issue is if this arm gets extended out, and now I'm holding him back, and I'm holding him from going where he wants to go. Now we got what what foul? Block push. This is probably gonna be a hole. Yeah, right. So I, I hear what you're saying, right? Um, you want the defender to get into the spot, move their feet, get a legal guarding position, and play it that way. That's almost never gonna happen. We're always gonna be doing something stupid. I'm right? just seeing it's it's actually affecting your rhythm, but. So, so if it is affecting the rhythm, now it becomes a point of, is the defense doing anything wrong? If the defense isn't doing anything wrong, and the offensive player's RSPQ gets affected, that's not my fault. Right? You're just going, like, if I'm standing here in my legal guarding position, and you decide to like, run into me and you lose your balance, that's not fault. Yeah, but if I'm like this, and I'm here, I'm okay. But the minute I start leading up to bump them, that's going to be like a full block. Right? Anything else? No? No more? Okay. This is my first presentation in Toronto, so thank you. Yeah, if 100%, if you guys ever have any questions, reach out to any of the veterans. Uh, reach out to anybody on the exec. A lot of these people are very, very willing to help. Um, like, I, I am where I am today because of these guys, so they're 100% willing to help you guys out of there. Okay. So work hard, don't be lazy, okay? All right, thanks.